Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 335, I'm very lucky, privileged to have uh, Clark Ott, uh, Dodd, excuse me, why am I saying Odd? Clark Dodd <laughs> on the podcast today. He is a like he is a former teacher turned consultant so, and has a bit of a thespian spirit about him. If he ain't doing CrossFit as well, who knows what he's doing. How are you today, sir? I'm very good, Mario. And uh, yeah, when people have a look at my life, some people might say it's a little bit odd. But uh, really grateful to be on the podcast today. So thanks for welcoming me in. No, I'm glad to have you. Glad to have you. Now, I have to, I have to start the podcast off with this. Now... You say on like on one of your bios that yeah you worked in uh, Asda in North Wales, like I did which, indeed. Like, yeah, which town was this in? <laughs> so I'm from a, a really small town that not many people have heard of in North Wales called Connors Key. So I grew up uh-huh. there until I was about 18, and then ran away to the other side of the fence in Manchester when I started university back in the day. <laughs> so like, wait, you went no i need to escape manchester was calling and like yeah oh my lord so connor's key is that by the sea or yeah so the most popular um places nearby are either wrexham or molds i think wrexham has come on the map quite a lot with the uh i think it ryan reynolds owns a football club I have so <laughs> That got some little poxy team like backed up by Hollywood <laughs> actors. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Did, did my first yeah. eighteen years. Escaped across to Manchester for university. A couple of years of teaching. Uh, eight or nine years worth of management consultancy around the world. And then here we are in the present day and going off into oh, yeah. freelance freelance life. Now you see, you are doing a hop, skip, and a jump forward, and like you know what, there's nothing wrong with that. But like, yeah, I have to ask now. One of the things going to university, coming out, and having job prospects. Yeah. Now, you had a rather good job prospect in all by all accounts. What made you like not go down that path? Well, um, I did uh, an internship at uh, an investment bank called Credit Suisse. Now, if anyone's listening to this podcast in a few years' time, that might be a bit of a relic of the past. So rest in peace, Credit Suisse. Um, I did an internship in their finance function for about 10 weeks. Absolutely loved it. Was uh, very well paid at the age of 20. Had a great time in London. But for me, the work wasn't exactly what I would would have liked to have done. Um, so I was quite bold. I got a great rating, but I turned down the graduate scheme, which left me um, in an interesting position in my third year, not having something lined up, which was a, a bit of a, an interesting period at the time. I can only imagine what like your friends and family said to you when you told them this. <laughs> because like Credit Swish, uh, they were still based, I believe, in Broadgate, most probably around about that time. Uh, Liverpool Street. Uh, yes, yeah, so they, I was in the office in Canary Wharf. Um, ah. So I was living in Greenwich at the time, met some amazing people that I'm, I'm still friends with today. Um, so yeah, turning down, I don't know whether it was boldness or maybe a bit of arrogance, because I think at the time I really believed, oh, if I've worked at an investment bank, I'll easily walk into another graduate position. But in my first round of applications, got continually rejected and probably had at least 15 rejections at the time. So what helped keep you going uh, through this like period of rejection? Yeah. So it was in my third years, living with a, a great group of guys. Um obviously getting into the serious mode now, having gone through the first couple of years of uni and did a a range of applications and essentially just saw another rejection email, another rejection email, another rejection email. And it was one of my best friends, uh, a a great guy called Harry had gone and done some volunteering in Costa Rica. So he told me about that. I got a really interesting idea of, okay, how about I just go and do that myself? Um, So I went and spent 10 weeks in a rainforest in Borneo doing a range of voluntary activities. 
And then as and when I came back, that gave me so much interview fuel about problem solving and teamwork and leadership that I was able to secure an offer with Teach First and the rest is history. Yeah, I see. So like this is the thing, I have to ask, like how many countries did you go around uh, teaching and what were you teaching? Just yeah, so all of my teaching was in London. So I was with, uh, there was a graduate scheme called Teach First, where yeah. when you write it down on paper, it does seem a little bit crazy because they take graduates with no teaching experience, give you about six weeks worth of training, and then put you into the most challenging schools that they can find. So a bit of a sink or swim mentality you need to get, get along with. Um, I think I saw a lot of a lot of uh, tears in the staff room. Um, not everyone made it through the first year, but it was a real test of resilience over that two year period. Because when you start, you've got really no idea what you're doing, and you're mm. trying to be a teacher, look after the kids, and also balance uh, work and life simultaneously. Yeah, can you tell us about a moment in your sort of teaching career on that two year program? What was a real test of your resilience? Um, so back in my first year, it did take me, a, took me about, I'd say four or five months before I was a, a, a really good teacher, I think. Mm. Um, and in those first, let's say four months, you, I was observed by a senior um, practitioner every two weeks. And for every two week observation, you have to do a lot more documentation, show all the lesson plan, show the seating plan on which kid is going to be sit by us, by which kid and for what reason, um, where their grades are expected to be by the end of the end of the term. Um, and I put, I tried really hard to get this observation to go well. And there was a small 13 year old kid who was maybe this high who just made it an absolute nightmare in all honesty. Um, he ended up running around the room, uh, making a little paper sword, hitting other, other kids on the head. And yeah, my behavior management in the first couple of months was completely atrocious. The observation went very badly. And <laughs> um, <laughs> luckily, they you know, all made great progress over the course of the year because I was a much better teacher by the end. But every two-week observation, um, you'd get like a, a feedback form. And on the feedback form, there would be all of your you know, things that you've done wrong and some of the things mm -hmm. you've done right. And then I remember starting in my first couple of weeks, it was like that. And then every week it's about how do you just chip down, do a little bit more good stuff, a little bit less bad stuff, learn, 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 learn. And then by the end of the year, it's like a couple of development points and lots of positive feedback. So oh. it's definitely a journey. But if you're not resilient, um, there was 16 of us who started in the same school. Um, I think a few people would probably admit that they had some kind of mental health challenges or sleep deprivation. Uh, and three people quit within the first four months, I think. So, yeah. That, so, why didn't you like? If it was going so well, why didn't you stick with it? It's a very big question. Um, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the, the teaching profession. Um, some of my friends are still teachers. It is very much Ooh. a lifestyle choice. So. There's a lot of pros and cons. You're, you're switched on throughout term time. Um, you do get some great holidays. You can't necessarily choose when they are. They're fixed by the term. Um, but your, your progression routes and your ability to go upwards is within a school or education environment is predominantly you know, becoming a head of a department, then becoming a head teacher at some point. So for me, um, I had actually thought about consultancy back in university. Um, it was one of the areas I was rejected from in my third year. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to do an internship at PwC in the summer holidays between my first and my second year of teaching. Ah, so, right. So that was your avenue in exactly. uh, to management consulting. Yeah. Right. So what was, now, what you've described with regards to, like, yeah, like, Doing the investment banking thing, quite intense. Doing the teaching thing, very intense. Yep. Now, management consultancy. I, I have a couple of friends who've 
lived that life and have done basically done their like one year sort of like yeah onboarding with a number of big companies how was it for you yeah i think um i was also a bit of a glutton for punishment in honesty i always love to throw myself into new and, and challenging circumstances so i thoroughly enjoyed pwc i think the training that i got was was awesome it was the i think the number one graduate scheme at the time so i started with this amazing community of everyone joining you know with a year or two of experience or straight from university some of my my best friends are, are from pwc when i've met them um i got a yeah really good set of experience um doing a rotation between different projects over the first year and a half or so and it was after that point that i found the type of work that i really enjoyed and i essentially just did that back to back for the remaining time i was there um both in um chicago uh, malaysia london romania and once i found the work that i really enjoyed that's what i've chosen to try and do throughout the rest of my career uh, and may I ask, what branch of management consultancy did you go down? Cool. So without uh, boring people too much, um, I specialized in operational excellence. So that is a blend of process improvement, um, cost reduction, team performance. So a lot of the projects I did, I would be looking after a department of people, or coaching the middle managers on how they can create a better culture within their team. How do you get clear on the performance metrics? How do you make sure that you're addressing problems in a using root cause analysis? Um, so that was really where I specialized um, and then built my career from there. Yeah, because like this is the thing, mm. like the game of management consultancy, uh, like as like it's a case of like from what I've learned from friends and like seeing what they've gone through, like the first two or three years, yeah. if like if they manage to like go through the uh, first year of coal, which is brutal uh, to say the least. You're not cut, you're not pulling your weight. You're out of the door. Bye bye. Uh, once you get past that, it's just the the amount of learning you do mm. with so many different companies. Yeah. Like trying to keep that all straight in one's head. Yeah. Uh, must have been a challenge. Like what were like what sort of systems did you put into play to like go? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is what I like, this is what I'm doing today. Yep. And this is how, like how I'm going to structure things going forward to bring success yeah. uh, to your role. Yeah. So I think part of the intensity within management consultancy is that you're typically trying to spin three plates at once. You've got your day-to-day -day client work, which is by far the most important that might be nine to five, nine to six, maybe nine to seven on a really, really busy project. Um, but you're trying to simultaneously do internal work. So make sure that the stuff that the consultancy is selling is is framed properly, that all the packs are as they should be, um, doing internal learning programs or anything like mm. that. And then as you progress through your career, you're also tasked with looking to do um, business development. So how do you nurture the right relationships? How do you understand where the problems are that the consultancy you work for is trying to solve? Um, so balancing those three can be quite difficult, particularly if you're someone who's ambitious, you want to be getting, you know, good performance ratings all around. That was definitely me whilst I was there. Um, I, yeah, so in all honesty, throughout my twenties, I pretty much put work-life balance as a quite a low priority. Um, it was only in my more recent years, I've readjusted having a more balanced life. Um, and it took me to leave consulting before I really had the, the opportunity to, to reflect. Yeah, and I, I'm, I, let me just say this, anyone who's listening and are thinking about management consultancy, no, like work-life balance does not exist. It's, it's a fallacy. <laughs> it's like anyone goes, it does, they're lying to you, they're it's, lying yeah. to you, or they're going to be one of those people cold in the first yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man yeah it can be pretty pretty difficult but uh, for me it was a really rewarding career um really enjoyed the time at pwc and the other two consultancies i worked for and part of why i've been so fortunate to be able to have traveled to i think 37 countries by now is be probably because at least 15 of them were all through work so I've been sent to uh, India a few times, worked in Malaysia, worked in the US, worked across Europe. So that's allowed me to tick off quite a few countries, um, 
paid for by the company. So well, that's fantastic. Like, how did you manage to like go into so many countries? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, with regards to working attitudes, like, <laughs> like, look, the British working attitude compared to an American working attitude yep. compared to an Indian working attitude. Never the twain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, how, like, what did you? I'm going to ask, what did you find the most interesting thing about the different attitudes mm. you had to like come across? Probably. And then I'm going to follow up with like, what frustrated you? Ooh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, there's probably two things that come into my mind um, that are most interesting. One is I did a, a project uh, over in Malaysia that was all focused around staff productivity and solving problems and improving managerial skills. Um, mm -hmm. So we delivered some great results. The thing that stood out for me is that from 11.30 to 1.30 every day, everybody would go out for a face-to-face -face lunch. So this was pre-COVID. Um, but the, the lunch culture within Malaysia is incredibly strong. So there was no meetings during that time. And eventually, <laughs> I was like, you know, may as, may as well go along with the tide. Um, when in exactly. And it's just, a, you know, you'd work pretty hard as soon as you get into the office. You do have a mm. solid sit down lunch with your colleagues. And that's really good for building relationships. And then some people would stay a bit later because of the, the traf after work traffic could have been quite bad. Um, but yeah, that's something that stood out because in London, I'd been so used to, uh, you know, running to prep, grabbing a sandwich, sitting at my desk, eating as quickly as I can and then carrying on. Um, oh, you went to Pret. You went somewhere fancy. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> I was like thinking boots or dare I say Tesco. <laughs> yeah, I remember as a graduate, we definitely made the most of the uh, the, the Tesco salads um, at London Bridge, which was a, a particular highlight. Um, and then another thing that, that stood out for me, I did um, one project in Romania similar kind of work, looking at productivity, trying to solve problems, uh, improve people's work-life balance, and also make sure business is running more effectively. It was mm. for uh, British American tobacco. So, <laughs> yeah, a bit, bit more on the, you know, not exactly one of the more socially res responsible companies I've worked for, but I've also worked for investment banks and, and otherwise. Um, but the thing that stood out for me at British American Tobacco is we were trying to understand, okay, why is everybody in the finance function on average so much less productive than other finance functions that we've seen? And we didn't really understand why until we went to go and visit. And then as soon as we visited, we joined the morning meeting at, let's say, 10 a.m. It would finish maybe 10.20. Yeah. Um, and then for the next half an hour, 80% of the staff would be outside smoking. And then you'd come to lunch and you'd finish. Everyone would have a half an hour lunch from maybe 12.30 to 1. And then another yeah. half an hour break of smoking. And then in early afternoon, another half an hour break of smoking. And the amount of time that people were spending smoking outside absolutely astonished me. Um, I think, yeah, Romania as a country, I saw smoking a lot more than I did in London. And obviously being a, a tobacco company, um, it was something that was, yeah, almost encouraged. Oh, come on now. They are taking, like, they are, well, taking much selection in the brand itself. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, like, very loyal consumers, at least. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Could you imagine the irony if they went, no, you can't do your yeah. smoke break. You're taking too long on your smoke breaks. Stop it. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's okay. Stop it. No. <laughs> oh, damn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like this, like, it's one of those things where I look at it and go, okay, you, you see so many companies out there right now mm. and you go, right. You've got these systems in play. We do this, we do that. Yeah. And trying to sort of maximize efficiency to like, yeah, get profits through the door. Yep. But with the sort of change of like let's say 2020 and everything like that what has like has there been a sort of big sort of step mark change you've seen how things operated then and how things are operating now or are they sort of 
moving slowly back in uh, more familiar directions. There. Yeah, interesting question. The the most obvious change is people's working habits and practices. So mm-hmm. obviously during COVID, everyone went fully remote. Um, and over time, it seems like firms are really trying to uh, get their own perspectives in place in terms of, are we happy with people staying 100% remote or setting the expectation of one, two, three days in the office? Um, mm. I think that's also influencing how effectively firms can hire because any firm who says you have to be in the office for four or five days a week um, probably is seen as a little bit archaic and people really value the flexibility now. So from a personal perspective, um, I like the opportunity to go into the office without it necessarily being mandated. And Mm. yeah, I think there's a healthy balance between the two. Even in my last year, I spent probably 90% of the time working from home because I had a very international team. Um, But to be able to go in and meet people face to face, I think is also really important. Because like this is the thing, especially with Mm. the work you do, like having to sort of monitor and track some of these efficiencies yep. and these operations. Yeah. Uh, it must be trickier now that, yeah, people are not so much scattered or, like all over the place, but there is like not that sort of emphasis and focus to come into the office all at once. Or as you say, there might be two days in the office, yep. three days in the office. Yeah. Some places are uh, most probably, as you say, arcane with their five days yeah. in the office. But I'll just, like I'm going to say that's going to be most management consultants yeah. at this <laughs> time. Get them back in. But like, hey, but yeah. So how would like has how have you managed to resolve that issue of like being able to like co- correlate that information to uh, understand the data? Yeah. So a lot of companies' data is automatically pulled from systems. So for example, without getting too technical, if you work in a finance function, it's very easy to see the amount of invoices that have been processed uh, down to an individual level and also volumes per per day or per period. So seeing that kind of data is is really quite easy. The we're also quite lucky since COVID, obviously Zoom and Microsoft Teams have developed quite a lot over the last four years, particularly. Um, I also used a lot of online collaboration tools like Miro or Mural, so that at mm-hmm. least we can have a, a virtual whiteboard if there is any sessions that we need to run that require you know, engagement and interaction. Um, what I've also have seen and I'm, I'm pretty sure anyone else in the, in the off office environment will have also noticed is that I think people try and multitask a lot more now. So if you're ever on a particularly long call and someone's not 100% engaged, you will see them kind of look down and do a bit of typing and then pay attention and then look at something else. And so a lot of people try and get their emails done in the background or you know look at something else if they're not finding the particular meeting that interesting. Mm, yeah, but okay. Like when ooh, systems in play. Oh, they're monitoring us, people. They're monitoring. <laughs> it's like oh yeah, spy software. Ah, so with this now, what has like made you decide to step out mm. by yourself? Because let's just say, okay, look, the world of management consulting, the hours are long. And they're painful at times, but you've got, like, if you're under a company, you've got the nice security of, at least I got a wage coming in, regular stock work. And now you're stepping out alone, like by yourself, with same long hours, most probably longer. (laughs) And like, yeah, but now you've got to do the hunt, like, if you don't have clients already, now hunt for new business. So what's given you that drive to do this? Yeah, so really good question. And when you explain it like that, it makes me sound a little bit crazy. Um, Because my, so I left consultancy, um, let's say, you know, a year and a couple of months ago. I then went to uh, a big uh, telecoms and technology company, worked there for a year, had uh, a pretty decent salary that was significantly in six figures. Um, and that was, as you might expect, quite comfortable. So I'd been thinking about 
starting something of my own for quite a while. And it was only when um, the company I was working for started doing lots of cost cutting um, that, you know, there was a, an opportunity to leave quietly um, and have extra money in the bank. So as and when the opportunity arose, I was very happy to, you know, take that as a sign and make the jump. Um, and yeah, the it is a bit of an, un, a lot of uncertainty ahead, not knowing mm-hmm. when you're next going to get paid or, you know, if I look into my calendar, I've got no idea what I'm going to be doing in four weeks time at all. I don't know whether I'll be sat in my flat. I don't know whether I'll be a client. I don't know whether I'll be, yeah, what will be going on, but that's part of the adventure. Um, but for me, it's around having a little bit more flexibility, being able to use my skills um, to help any organization that needs it. Um, because the the challenge of working for a consultancy full-time at my level is that it would become more about sales over time and less about yeah. doing the you know the technical delivery that I that I've really enjoyed through my career. So to be able to be able to, to do that for clients without having a, a big sales target that I need to run after, um, that's what I'm I'm hopefully going to be doing for the foreseeable. Uh, like this is the thing. Like I'm I'm sorry to do this to you, but I'm gonna have to push back on you a little yeah. because like if it was to sort of get away from sales, like what you've like what you've done here. Yeah. You've pushed yourself front and center more so yeah. into sales. Not unless if you've got a partner that's like behind the camera. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, you know what I mean? You've sort of like gone, don't really want to do sales. I'm going to go out by myself doing more sales. Yeah. But, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. No, you're definitely right. The the response, there has to, there is um, a, quite a significant mindset shift that is needed doing what I'm doing now where I'm not selling a company's product or a company's services. Um, Mm -hmm. What I'm now having to think about is I am the product that is being marketed and being sold. So yeah, sales is definitely a, a core requirement. But as soon as I land that first project of three to six months, the, you know, there won't be a target to sell two million that I'll need to think about during that time. So I'm pretty much just selling one person, hopefully continually, um, that is the goal, rather than balancing the, you know, delivery and then trying to sell, you know, five people's worth, six people's worth as the sales target might increase over time. That might come in future, but for now, quite keen to just keep myself busy um, doing work that I enjoy uh, for any companies that that need my skill set. Mm. Like it seems like you've got, how can I say, you you're on a you're on another journey. Yeah. It's not like yeah. management consultancy is. You love to do it, but you're on a journey. I'm not too sure what that journey is. I'm not. I'm. I have I'm not. Have you figured out what that journey is, or are you trying to still find it yourself? It's very. I feel like I'm on a little bit of exploration mode at the moment. In honesty, so. My ideal scenario is get a contract that keeps me busy for the next six months. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm dating a, a lady that I uh, yeah I'm very keen to make things work with. Um, who, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> so she might want to do a bit of travel starting from December and for about five months. So for me, mm-hmm. having that flexibility to I'll even have the opportunity to do a couple of months of travel after six months of work would is something I find you know very attractive. So who knows what happens after that, where things will go and what opportunities pop up. But for the next couple of years, try and help as many companies as I can using my skill set and then try and find the opportunity to reflect and, and plan the next couple of years after that. I'm liking this. I'm liking this a lot. Now, like, this is the thing. Like, I, I have to ask. Yeah. Now, like, with regards to all your management consultancy, yep. that provides a certain level of challenge, a diff, like a, a degree of pushing yourself, yeah. like mentally, like sometimes even physically. <laughs> now, what would you say 
is your sort of greatest challenge or achievement outside of that realm? Oh, uh, my greatest achievement outside of consultancy. Um, I think I'm, I'm someone who's particularly goal driven. Um, okay. Career wise, I got to exactly where I wanted to by my early 30s. You know, I was a, a senior manager for one of the, you know, one of one of the most respected um, consultancies in the world. I delivered one of the biggest projects of my career um, a couple of years ago. So really proud of what I achieved from a consultancy perspective. And I'm also very lucky that I own um, my own flat in London. So I originally bought it at 24. Um, and which can be, sound quite surprising to people, but I was really lucky because the only way that I was able for me to do it um, was mm. through a scheme called shared ownership. So yeah, yeah started off with 25%, um, only needed like an £11,000 deposit. But that then was a really good step back back in my early 20s um, to set the foundations for, for where I am now. Blimey. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Because like the reason why I asked yeah. uh, that asked that question mm. is because okay, you like you've seemed to have, uh, for everything you're saying you've hit most of your goals and targets. Yeah. You aimed high. Yeah. <clears throat> you've aimed well. You've aimed true, and you've got what you wanted. Yeah. Now, like with also in your bio with doing the obstacle training, mm-hmm. doing like CrossFit. How do you know someone does CrossFit? I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. With all the CrossFit, which is like physically demanding yeah. on like a totally different mindset and arena. Mm. It's like, yeah. Do you think with regards to like, I don't see you being a person who will do something small. I might be wrong in that. Yeah, yeah. So I think what excites me um, or how I try and live my life, and, and again, it's getting a little bit philosophical. I read a, okay. a book many years ago that was really influential to me, and it's called uh, The Chimp Paradox by Dr. Steve Peters, really about uh-huh. mental models and how you my book. Have you read it yourself as well? No, no, I, like this is. Really, I'm aware of the yeah. Chimps so, yeah. really influential book that I read in in my early twenties, and there's an exercise in that book that says, imagine you're a hundred and you're on your deathbed, and your great great grandchild comes to you. You've got one minute left before you die, and they say, great grandfather or great grandmother, what should I do with my life? And I reflected on that in my early 20s, and I've actually got it written on my wall up here. And the guidance that I gave to my philosophical great-grandchild was continually pursue opportunities where you can maximize your potential, meditate, and exercise. And that's pretty much what's been the driving force of my life. If there's ever something where I think I'm going to learn or I'm going to be pushed to in new directions, then I'm pretty much going to jump on it most of the time. Mm. I'm curious to, I'm curious to see how you see this. Mm. Do you see, do you see this as something to fill your appetite or to just continuously keep on playing? Ooh, good question. I think I always want to be making progress in some area of life. Um, I typically think about a few different areas. I either think about my my health, uh, my finances, what I know and understand, um, relationships and having fun. So as long as I'm making progress in at least some of those areas, then I know that I'm moving in the right direction. Um, I okay. think in all honesty, the I was so work-focused and finance-focused throughout my 20s it then took me over the last couple of years to really reframe my priorities because I felt like I didn't really put as much into fun and relationships as, as I would like to be doing going forward. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. But which one is it? Fill your, like, 
Are you are you trying to fill yourself, like, mm-hmm. or you just want to continue to speak, play the game? I think I want to continuously, for the, definitely for the foreseeable. Ask me again when I'm in my fifties, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, for now I definitely want to be keep keep playing, keep progressing. Yeah, the only reason why I push you on that, mm. it's a case of there is the Olympic syndrome, the gold medal, like gold medal champion. Yeah, yeah. Like you achieve whatever goal you have, yeah. like whatever it might be. And then like there is this realm of like people being lost uh, in a realm of despair because their, their purpose, their drive, mm. everything was focused on that sort of key thing. Yeah. And once that happens, they've achieved it. It's like, what do I have to get up for? Yeah. Like, or they're not that as hungry as they were before. And yeah. when people are just like, I want to continuously play the game. Mm. It's like, okay. Doesn't matter. Like, it's like, yeah, I've got points on the board. Still keep on going. Got points on the board. Still keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. And I, t- like, from what I've seen yeah. as an observer, yeah. I think people who just want to play the game because they love to play the game, generally are more happy mm. than people who just like, I, yes, I want to f- feed on this thing, yeah. feel full, and then like, yeah, achieve what I want to achieve, and I'm done. Yeah, kind of. Or they, or they're not done, but then they don't know what to do. Mm. Next. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I think for me, having something to be working towards is mm-hmm. something that definitely keeps me engaged and focused. So even I imagine when I'm you know, approaching retirement, I would still like to be engaged in intellectual discussion. I'd still be like to sit on a board of maybe a charity. I'd still like to be doing something that keeps my brain working and that I can hopefully add value to and, and help progress. Um, mm. I think the idea of me just sitting on a beach and drinking pina coladas all day every day um, is fine for like a week or two, but I can't see myself doing that long term. No, at the beach is a trap. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone believe like most people believe they want that. Yeah. But in all honesty, I think what people want to seek out is like, yeah, some form of purpose and yeah. something what gives them drive mm. in their life. Exactly. And when they do find that, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. That's like one of the things I've like I think people fall into because they haven't taken a sort of bite at the cherry of life mm. enough times they don't necessarily find that purpose yeah. or yeah. like, and that's the, I think that is the crux of it sometimes, mm. you know? Yeah. 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 Cause I think if, if someone has a, a clear why and a clear vision of where they want to get, then mm. it's really easy to wake up every day and know and feel happy about what you're doing and, and feel like you're moving in the direction that you want to be going. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I have to ask now, What's actually brought you on to your, like podcasting? Because now, nah, yeah, you know what I mean? Management consulting, yeah. podcasting, <clears throat> not really sort of what I would say always mixed together, if you go out. Right. Yeah. So why? Yeah. Why podcast? What, what are you getting your name out with? That? So um, a few different reasons, actually. I have met some... I went, I spent some time in Bali over December and January and to, to go to somewhere like that with a completely open mind to be able to meet people from all different walks of life was yeah, for me quite inspirational to be able to just hear different perspectives and challenge my own ways of thinking. And Mm -hmm. although I'm back in London and sat in Bermondsey for me, I'm quite keen to continue to meet lots of different people. So I've been quite active on LinkedIn over the last few months. I'm also doing like a a 100 coffees challenge. So I've met 35 people, a few that I've reconnected with from previous years, quite a few new people in different ways. So it's a really good way for me to, you know, keep perspective on you know, everybody else is fighting their own battles. Everybody else is working on their own priorities, um, but also extending my hand out to whoever might need help. Um, if there's anything interesting I can learn from the other person. And I've been quite lucky to meet loads of loads of people throughout 
particularly 2024, um, that have just shown me different things that they're doing and give me different perspectives and and even things I wasn't aware of. So even the idea to podcast um, came from somebody I met uh, a couple of months ago, and I think he's done maybe 300, 200 or 300 by now. Um, ah, yeah. Winning. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so he was the, the person who kind of even just presented that as an idea. Uh, so I was like, yeah, cool. I want to try that and meet lots of interesting people uh, like yourself and then, yeah, see what happens. Oh, excellent. Now, do you think rather than being a guest mm. on the podcast, you might start one yourself? Maybe, maybe one day. Um, yeah, as a disclosure, this is only my first ever podcast. So for me, it's around building experience, um, understanding uh, the, the industry, so to speak. And mm-hmm. maybe in the future, I think that's something I'll have to balance alongside, you know, if I if I stop my next contract, I'm particularly busy. Um, I probably wouldn't have as much time to be able to, you know, host and manage one myself. But mm-hmm. never say never. So. Right. I put it this way, if you're doing six months here and you're taking two months off there, you know what I mean? You can get like a, quite a few episodes in if you like, well, organize your time wisely. Yeah. I'm saying this for management control. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yeah, I don't see why not. Uh, their podcast show is taking place in London. Right. I think the 20, wait. 22nd, I think the 23rd uh, of this month. So, yeah, in Island. So, yes, shout outs to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So, with regards to the journey, mm. where would you like this journey to take you in, say, the next five years? Um, what, like, if we were to sit down and speak again? Mm. Uh, yeah, where would you like it to take you? And by journey, are we talking about the journey of life? Well, the journey of like the journey of life, yeah. like the journey of business. Yeah, it's your journey. So, for me, um, I would be very keen to have built uh, quite an established contracting career, definitely over the next three mm-hmm. three years or so. Um, and continuing to refine my own expertise, having a big enough audience or platform that, uh, you know, what there are different opportunities for me to work and I don't necessarily have to hunt for them in the same way as uh, most contractors do at the start of the journey. Um, who knows what will happen relationship wise, but there is a, there is a girl on my mind. Um, and over the next five years, I'm really excited to see where that goes. Family is something that I also would like in the future. Um, whether I live in London, that's up for grabs. I think I would like to have my my place in Bermondsey rented out one day, um, mm-hmm. and then who knows? Maybe maybe live in Latin America or maybe somewhere in Europe. Or yeah, that depends on. Yeah, life is unpredictable, but moving towards family, having good financial stability and continuing to progress in my career. Those would be three good outcomes over the next five years. Ah, brilliant. Brilliant. Sadly, I have no more questions to ask you. But like, yes, I, I've got to say, hey, Clark, it's been a pleasure Thank you so having much. you on the podcast today. Uh, yeah. How can the people out there find you ah. out on the internet? Well, um, it is a blessing and a curse that I have a quite a unique uh, first name. So if you simply type in Clark Dodd into Google, you'll find uh, any any of my socials. I'm most active on LinkedIn recently. So yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Or if you want to catch up with me individually and, and grab a virtual coffee, my door is, is very much open. So just Clark Dodd on LinkedIn. And that'll be the best place to find me. Perfect. Awesome. Go out there, find Clark, and yes, connect with him. Get a virtual coffee. Yeah, have a chat. And yeah, like I promise he will not talk about CrossFit because yeah, we've done it. I'll do my best. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Clark, for coming on today. No worries. Appreciate it. Thank you. An honor.
No problem. And I'd like to say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors, for sticking with us to the end of the show. Please stay well, stay safe, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Have a good one, guys. Peace. Ah, and, and we are out.